topic I'm supposed to talk about now, I know for two minutes, so it's going to be completely improvised, which is better, I think, than to have something prepared. Um, so the first thing I would like to do is the, the topic of free energy is really a, a big, broad thing. There are hundreds of developers with hundreds of different technologies. Uh, I would like to reduce it on a portrait of four different people, including their history, also to get the social problem of the topic already in this history of these people into the room. Uh, and the four people were taking completely different approaches. And I hope if we put them, all the four of them, aside, that, it, that we can grab the essence of it. And it's not going to be a quintessence, it's mm. going to be a quarter, quarter sense then. <laughs> um, and I would like to start... <coughs> Uh, with Victor Schauberger as the first one. Victor Schauberger lived from 1800, I'm not 100% sure, 80 maybe to six, six, eight, 1960 about. And he was born in Austria and he was a man of the woods, of the forests. Um, this is what he studied to take care of forests and tr transporting wood down the rivers was one main topic of his work. And um, he spent a lot of time just observing nature. He was in the forest at a small river watching the fish, the trouts especially, doing things that were impossible. How can a trout stand still in the water, not moving at all, while, Sorry. <laughs> while the water is flowing? The trout is just freezed in the water, and compared to the water, it's, it's swimming, but it's not moving. So this was impossible. So he got curious and, and tried to find out how does the trout this. He was looking at the motion of the water for hours and hours and hours, and was looking at these vortices building up in the water. And he realized uh, that they are, were accelerating, they were speeding up in a way um, that was violating the laws of energy conservation. There was suddenly too much motion compared to what was before. So it was like the, the motion of the river was starting to concentrate on single spots in the water and you got like hurricanes with an immense velocity and speed of flow. And this, because he was uh, um, meant to, to transport trees down the rivers he had exactly to know how water flows to make an intelligent solution. So this was his, uh, uh, his first big invention, revolutionizing the wood transport system in Austria. And he brought it down to 10% of the costs <coughs> before. Because he, he was flowing with the water. And... Um, um, then he started to extract the concepts of nature he had uh, observed with trouts and water and started to, to work on machinery, on inventions that were supposed to, to solve other problems of humanity. The first thing he, he, he was doing, he was trying to extract electricity from water flows like having a, a little hole in a bucket and the water was running down, passing copper plates and suddenly uh, electric uh, um, uh, voltage was building up, up to 40,000 volts. And he was trying to utilize this just from the electricity created by flowing water. Um, and he was very successful in voltage but not in current. So it was not, not a good way to, to, to power machinery because you had the voltage, but you couldn't extract energy. So he dropped that. Then um, um, he was looking what does this special type of vertical motion do to the quality of water. 
and he started to build machines that were moving water nature like in vortices and uh, vortices was one way the other way he adopted certain structures out of the um, kemen the breathing organs of a trout or fish I don't know the, the English. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And if, if, if you open it, you can see a kind of wave structure <coughs> in this organ. And when the water is flowing over it, it's, it creates a vibration in the water and certain microscopic flow structures. And this he was uh, <coughs> transforming into an invention, a machine that was just a, a round copper plate that had this ripples starting like when you drop a stone into water, the, the wave structure yeah. on the water surface. This build in copper, and then you, you ro rotate this disc in an egg shape, at the bottom of an egg shape. And then, because it's turning, the water is trying to escape to the side and is flowing over these ripples of the copper plate and creating a vortex in the egg. And this is tremendously changing the quality of the water. Um, if you add some things like a little bit carbon dioxide to the water, it's sucked into the molecular structure of water and they let him experiment with a clinic for cancer disease. And it took six weeks and this clinic was empty just by drinking this water. Um, he managed to create a diesel, diesel type fuel with a little bit of charcoal and carbon dioxide put into this egg-shaped thing with a vortex. And if you let it run for a while, you could extract diesel fuel to run diesel engines. And you, you don't rotate it in water, but you rotate it in air. Um, it is having also very interesting effects, <coughs> but different ones. Um, he derived two machines from this. One was called the Klimato. It was this disc rotating in a box with a certain shape, and the, the air that was coming out was collecting or emitting heat radiation. So if you turn it with 3,000 rounds per second, it's cooling. So the, the air, especially with the, with the vapor, with the uh, water content of the air coming out, that is the thing that is carrying uh, this quality, was sucking the heat radiation out of the room, destroying it. So you could cool an overheated room with it. And if you were turning with 6,000 uh, rounds per minute, it was the opposite effect. The water vapor was emitting heat radiation. And you need very little energy. It's just only the engine to run this uh, copper, uh, copper plate. It needs 200 watts, maybe, like two light bulbs. And you can heat a, um, a room of two or three hundred square meters with it in the, in the winter, or cool it if it's too hot, without any difference in, in the energy consumption. That was one thing. And the other one, that was to the point where the military got started to get interested in his work. <coughs> um, the same thing, rotating in air, if you added some radio, radioactive uh, um, components to ionize the air was creating anti-gravity. And uh, the first device he built, this is called the Repulsine, was looking like a flying saucer with this disc rotating in the middle, taking, sucking up the air from the top, taking the air over the rotating um, um, disc and then pulling it down to the sides. And the device was this size, and it developed 40 tons of anti-gravity. It would have, would have been able to lift a, a block of 40 tons. And this machine, they, uh, because people got interested in what he, what he was doing there, they started to try and steal his knowledge. So he was not there, and they tried to, to, to run the machine without being authorized to do it and it plugged out the screws from the concrete uh, from, from, from the, from the uh, bottom and it, it took off and smashed <laughs> at the top of the room on the ceiling in 15 meters high. 
So the, the first machine was destroyed by somebody who tried to run it without having permission. And uh, this was towards Second World War, so uh, the German military got very interested, but he refused to work with the Nazis. He didn't want to, so he was uh, a little bit in trouble in these times. And it didn't really get better after the war, because uh, then the Russians uh, stole all his paperwork, they just robbed his private flat, and the Americans put him into a working space where he, no, he was not allowed to leave. So he was kind of forced to stay at one place, and then they tried to contract him in the United States with a consortium of companies. And the end of the story was that um, um, basically he lost the rights to make research. He had to sign contracts so that he stops and doesn't uh, do anything with it. <coughs> the last thing, he was working in this short <coughs> period between the Second World War and his death. The last project was the, um, it's called Heimkraftwerk, even in English uh, um, language. Uh, it was just taking the, the ability of water to speed up in a vortex. It looked like the horns of an antelope. And then you take six of them and build a kind of um, vortex shape out of these horns. And you put in water on the top and it accelerates in the horn and comes with very high speed out at the bottom. And so the entire thing is starting to rotate. And the energy coming out of this speed of water pushing out like a, like a jet engine was so much more energy than you needed to pump the wa water back up to the starting point that it was running a generator. That was the Heimkraft. You wanted to have it as, as a solution to produce electricity in every single building household uh, to have electricity for free. And they had very big problems to, to regulate the system because it, it had the tendency to speed up, speed up, speed up, and then killing the generator. So they worked on it for about eight, nine years and didn't manage to get it really running in a way that you could market it. This was the company Swarovski from Austria. They are known for jewelry. jewelry, crystals. And they're into the topic since before the Second World War. Still today, Swarovski is financing a lot of research in this area. It's a company tradition. <coughs> yes, so <coughs> this was Schauberger's work towards uh, um, free energy in the sen uh, sense of, of creating energy to use for machinery or for flying. He did a lot of research also on plants and plant growth, which is a very interesting topic as well, but maybe I'll come back to this later. I just want to focus now on the, on the energy.